Hello YouTube, I am back after a little break and I'm here to talk to you guys today about one of my favorite, favorite topics. But first, I am just whipping myself up a warm afternoon drink. It's fall and today is actually pretty cold. I think it's like in the 50s. So to me that's um, Arctic pretty much. <laughs> so I really like to have warm drinks throughout the day but I have to limit myself to like one cup of coffee in the morning. If I drink more than that, my stomach just doesn't seem to do too well with it. So for a warm afternoon drink, I usually have a not coffee tea, which is what I'm gonna make. I have my water boiling behind me um, and my tea is in here right now. And I get this from Farmhouse Teas. I'll link this for you guys. It is so, so delicious. Let's see what's in here. There's chicory root, dandelion root, um, lots of good stuff in here, lots of good stuff. And it is so good. It tastes really close to coffee. I get the uh, chocolate conniption. So then I put a marshmallow in there, add my cream, and it's pretty fabulous. John and the kids are up in the woods cutting wood today. We've been doing that over the last several days. We do have a wood stove, so we go through quite a bit of wood throughout the winter. We have only had this log splitter for a couple years, not that long. So before that, the guys cut all the wood by hand. And they still do some, um, but this thing is pretty handy. John's mom and dad live right here on the farm with us. This is their farm. We just live on, on their farm with them, I should say. I should rephrase that. But anyway, uh, their house is heated by wood in the winter, so they need quite a bit of firewood as well. And this is just one of those chores that I think is so good for the kids. Just so good for them to get out there and do with the guys. They're learning a skill, learning life skills, I should say, and they actually enjoy it. I just need to steep my tea for a few minutes, like six to eight minutes, something like that. Then I'll pour it over my whipped cream. I always use my immersion blender to whip my cream and sugar in my coffee mug before I pour my coffee or tea over. It's just really good that way. I really like it. Then I'll add a few marshmallows, which these are my egg white marshmallows. And I, I do have this recipe on my blog, so I will link that in the description for you guys. All right, got my drink. On to the topic of the day. So one of my favorite, probably my favorite topic of all times would be, I guess the best way to say it is childbearing. I don't wanna focus in too narrowly on fertility because I really just love everything to do with the entire childbearing season. Just the way that God designed the woman's body, our cycles, and it's all amazing. So today specifically, I wanted to talk to you guys about birth control. So within the childbearing umbrella, this is probably my least favorite, but also favorite thing to talk about because I'm just gonna put it out in the open. I would call myself a crusader against birth control. I am that anti-birth control. Oh, there are just so, so many reasons for this. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about. But um, I actually wasn't sure how I was gonna do this video. I didn't know if I was going to make it more of an informational style video where I sat down and just like give you guys a bunch of info or do more of a Q&A. And I decided to do a Q&A. So I put a question box up on Instagram maybe a week ago and I did answer a lot of questions. I have a ton of content on birth control on Instagram, but I figured I would take a lot of the questions that I got from that question box and then answer them here on YouTube. Before I talk about birth control in general, I'll give you guys a little bit of an update that you didn't ask for on where I'm at in my childbearing season. So I am 33. I am well over halfway through my childbearing season, which is so, it's sad to me. I mean, I'm excited about getting older. There are so many great things that come with getting older. It's a blessing for sure, but it's kind of sad to think that, gosh, in less than 10 years, this season of my life will be over. I always thought that I would just have all the babies. When I met my husband, I think I knew him for a total of like a week and I told him I wanted like 10 kids. I said, I will never use birth control. I want all the babies. And I do come from a um, 
Christian upbringing where sanctity of life was taught to me very well. And so I've always known that when I finally did get married, I wanted to leave the amount of children I had up to God. And I do have my mom and dad and the Catholic Church to thank for that. And I'm eternally grateful because this is something, sanctity of life, which birth control is a sanctity of life issue. This is something that the most of the modern church is actually very confused on. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But anyway, back to my update. So I'm 33 and I am nine months postpartum and I'm still nursing him around the clock. He nurses at night, he nurses during the day. So I'm not expecting my cycle to return anytime soon. I have pretty generous natural spacing, um, which if you guys don't know what that is, then, then you'll just have to look it up. I'm not gonna go into that on this video, but for most women, notice the word most i'm not saying all i know there are exceptions but for most women who exclusively breastfeed around the clock um, that's natural birth control you're not going to get your cycle back for quite a long time uh, it's very rare for it to come back before six months i actually have people in my life who have had it come back before six months so once again i know it happens i know it happens but it's rare so after my third baby it took 15 months for me to get my first cycle back and at that point it wasn't even regular so i probably wasn't fertile for a good year and a half yeah ernie's nine months old i'm not expecting any action anytime soon i would love to be pregnant again i would love to have more babies close together but it just seems to be that that is not the way that God designed me. However, I did get pregnant nine months after my first baby was born. So my first and second are, yeah, they're like 18 or 19 months apart because he was nine months old when I got pregnant. Now I was in nursing school, so I was pumping a lot and he was drinking from a bottle. So I think that's why my spacing wasn't quite as long as my third baby, but anyway, it is a possibility and I know that I do want more babies in the future. Of course, that is not up to me. Ultimately, it is in the Lord's hands. He opens and closes the womb, but I'm ready. Whenever it happens, I am ready. So I just wanna do my part in making sure that my body is ready. Like I said, I'm in my 30s now, so I do want to be very conscious of taking care of myself and staying nourished so I don't get depleted here in the tail end of my fertile season. So something that I am going to do today is, I've got the paperwork right here, I'm going to send in a hair sample. I'm actually getting a hair tissue mineral analysis. So essentially it's just going to show me my mineral status and show me if I have any areas where I have some work to do, where I'm depleted, where I could use some supplementation or need to tweak my diet. And I'm really excited about this. So unlike blood work, which just gives you a snapshot of where you're at for any particular day, the HTMA gives you a picture of your mineral status over like the last three months. So I just think this would be a good place for me to start, but I'll probably do some blood work Two, like I said, I just wanna make sure that I'm being careful. I've got four kids, hoping for more kids. I've got a lot of responsibilities and I need to um, take care of myself. You know, in the Bible, God often compares a woman's fertility to that of a garden, commanding us to be fruitful and multiply and calling the wife a fruitful vine and children olive shoots. He uses analogies like that a lot. So when I think of my body being fruitful, I think of a garden. What would you want to do to prepare your garden for a fruitful season? And um, one of the things that you might consider doing is a soil analysis. And whether you do a soil analysis or not, you need to prepare your soil. And it's the same way for us as women. Whether you do blood work or any kind of testing or not, you need to make sure that your body is prepared to grow and to nourish a baby. So I'm not going to go into prenatal nutrition on this video, but I do have a blog post where I share my prenatal routine, things that I do to stay nourished while I'm pregnant and leading up to pregnancy. So I'll link that for you guys in the description below. Okay, so that is my little update on where I'm at right now. Now let's get to your question. Okay, so the big question debate that I always like to have in my Instagram stories is, is birth control biblical? And with that always comes a lot of questions from you guys wanting me to show you specific verses. So a lot of questions like, if you're saying birth control isn't biblical, well then show me the verse. Show me the verse that says, you know, you shall not take the pill, or you, you should not get a vasectomy, you shouldn't get your tubes tied, um, you shouldn't use barrier methods like condoms or whatever. And I definitely have an answer for that, a lot of answers actually, but 
I would first pose a question in return. I would ask, okay, show me the verse saying that it is wrong for one to get a sex change surgery or take hormones to transition to the opposite gender. Show me the verse, the specific verse. Guys, there is no specific verse. <laughs> There's also no specific verse um, about the plan B pill or getting an early abortion or even a late term abortion. There's no specific verse on that. But I think as Christians, we all know that those things are wrong. When God created man and woman, the very first thing he did was he blessed them and he blessed them by giving them a command. So go read this in Genesis, okay? Don't take my word for it. Everything I'm saying, have your Bible open and, and study it for yourself. But the first thing God did when he created man and woman, this is before the fall, pre-fall, okay? He blessed them with a command. So the command that he gave them is a blessing, and that command is to be fruitful and to multiply. That is a pre-fall command, and it's a post-fall and post flood command that was then given to Noah and his sons as well to be fruitful and multiply. And um, it's a really rich study to actually read those passages in the original languages and read the meanings of those, those words. Because when God tells us to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, the word that he uses for fill is like fill to overflowing. God made us in his image and he wants us to be like him and he creates life. God is the creator of life. He wants us to be like him and to be fruitful and multiply and allow him to create life through us. That is a command that still stands today. And anytime I say that, people always ask, are you quiverful? I gotta be honest, guys, I'm not exactly sure what quiverful is. I've heard it plenty of times. I could look into it. I just haven't felt compelled to look into it. But from what I understand, it's more on the cultish side of things. And what I mean by that is, you get into being cultish when you take one issue and you elevate it above every other issue in scripture or every other issue in the Christian life. So I think what it does, if I'm understanding this correctly, is it takes the issue of childbearing and having children and it elevates it almost to like a salvation level um, and maybe makes people seem like they're not saved if they don't have children, if they're barren or something. Um, if I'm getting that wrong, feel free to correct me. But that's what I understand the Quiverful movement does. There's a lot, there's other things that come along with it. And I don't think that or promote that at all. So that's a question that I've gotten. Another question I get is, since I'm referencing Old Testament command, then do I also keep all of the other commands in the Old Testament? Because there are a lot. And the answer to this is no. There's a difference between ceremonial law and moral law and natural law in the Old Testament. I'm not gonna break that all down for you guys, but I'm um, just giving you a good jumping off place here to go look that up. Look up the difference between ceremonial law and moral law and natural law. So ceremonial law was um, in place to foreshadow the coming of Jesus, to get God's people used to a blood sacrifice and atonement system. Keeping the law has never been how God's people were saved. God's people in the Old Testament were not saved by keeping the law. They were saved by their faith. This was just, like I said, foreshadowing. It was a picture of the Messiah who was to come, the perfect lamb of God who would be slain and whose blood would serve as a covering for us so that death would pass over us. So the ceremonial law has been fulfilled in Jesus. I don't keep it. I don't have to keep it. As a Christian, you don't have to keep it. We are still bound to keep God's moral law, things such as do not kill, do not steal, do not commit adultery, etc. And we are still called to live in keeping with natural law. We are to respect God's creation and the way that he created our bodies. And we're not to exchange natural relations for relations or ways of being that are unnatural, which you will know if you have read Romans chapter one. And another question I get a lot is, well, you know, we've had one or two kids, so we have already multiplied. Well, that is not multiplying, that is replacing. If you and your spouse have had two kids, then that you have replaced yourselves. You have not multiplied. And so I guess you could get into the argument of, okay, well, we've had three or four kids, so now we have multiplied. But if you guys really want to do a deeper study of this, which I highly recommend, it involves surveying the entire Bible 
from front to back and thinking about every aspect of this issue. A great resource for doing so is this book right here. It is called Be Fruitful and Multiply by Nancy Campbell. It is actually a Bible study, so after each chapter there are some questions just to help you think about where you're at in regards to some of these issues. I've read several books on this topic from a Christian perspective and this is by far the best in my opinion. All right, so the next question that I get is what about non-hormonal birth control? So a lot of Christians get that we cannot, as Christians, use hormonal birth control because these types of contraceptives are abortifacients. It doesn't matter what your doctor tells you, read the manufacturer insert. All types of hormonal birth controls have the potential to be abortifacients. Even the ones that say they prevent you from ovulating so that sperm would never meet egg, there could never be a scenario in which an egg would be fertilized and then aborted, that's just not true. That is always possible when you're using hormonal birth control. So a fair number of Christians do understand and agree with that, that we're not to use any kind of birth control that could cause an abortion. So that leads me into a question I get a lot, which is what about more natural forms of contraceptives? So uh, people usually ask about condoms, about the withdrawal or pull out method, um, spermicides, things in that arena. So once again, we have to go back to natural law and God's purpose for marriage in creation. Why did God create marriage? The easiest way to think about this is he created it for procreation and for unity. There are two purposes. You could potentially break the unity down into like bonding between spouses and also a reflective picture of Christ and the church and how they're unified, but it's, it's basically procreation and unity in that order. Order matters, you guys. Throughout the Bible, if you've studied the Bible, you will know that when things are mentioned and commanded in a certain order, it is for a reason. So I would ask you to go back and look at the first words that were spoken to man and woman when God created them and he created marriage between them. It was to be fruitful and multiply. That was the first purpose. Eve was created from Adam to be his helpmate because he can't reproduce all by himself. He can't produce alone. He needs a woman to reproduce for the human race to be born. So Eve was created to be his helper and the chief purpose of that is procreation. There are a lot of other purposes too, so don't get hung up on that guys, but that is the chief purpose of marriage. What I have seen, like I said, I grew up Catholic, but I'm Protestant now. I would consider myself Protestant now. Um, but what I have seen is in the Protestant church, there is not really a good grasp on the purpose of marriage at all. Most weddings that I've seen, the couple writes their own vows, and while that's very sweet and heartfelt, it really doesn't mention or have anything to do with glorifying God and fulfilling his purpose for marriage. Whereas traditional wedding vows, and praise the Lord, these are the kinds of wedding vows that I took. I took traditional vows reflect God's purpose for marriage. So in traditional wedding vows, a couple is asked questions like, do you come here freely to enter into this marriage? And then they're asked, will you lovingly accept children from the Lord? Will you raise them up in his church? And the couple has to say, I do, to each of those questions in order to be married. This used to be the standard in all churches, in Protestant churches, in the Catholic church. This was the standard before the 20th century. We've lost a lot of things in the 20th century when it comes to our heritage and our history and our understanding of scripture. So when it comes to using contraceptives, whether you're using hormonal forms like the pill or like an IUD or an implant or whether you're using more natural forms. All of these violate God's purpose for marriage. Guys, if you study the entire Bible, there is no precept or precedent or pattern for limiting family size or family planning, like planning when you wanna have a child or waiting a few years after you get married. That is non-existent in the Bible. Children are always referred to as a blessing. God always wants to multiply his people, whether it be through the word or through the womb. All right, the next question I get 
all the time is what about natural family planning? So this is basically a woman charting her cycles. You can use, there are different methods to do this. You can take your temperature, you can look at cervical fluid. There are, there are different methods. But anyway, is it okay to chart your cycles and try to prevent pregnancy that way? Now this is just my take. I do think that natural family planning can be biblically permissible. I think a good rule of thumb is to think of it like this. The only biblical form of birth control is self-control, which is abstinence. And that is what natural family planning is. It is abstaining strategically for a five to six day window in a woman's cycle to avoid getting pregnant. Now, this is the question that I would ask is why? Why are you doing that? Just because you don't want babies or you feel done or you don't see how God would provide for your family if you add another baby, then that is unbiblical because we're called every day to ask that he would give us our daily bread and we're supposed to put faith in that. So for the Christian couple who is walking with the Lord, and if you're walking with the Lord, then you're not sitting around playing video games all day. If you're walking with the Lord in every area of your life to the best of your ability, of course, we all fall short. I know that and things happen. We all fall on hard times sometimes, but if a Christian couple is walking with the Lord and the husband is is working and providing for his family and, and the woman is fulfilling her role as a wife and a mother then we are called to put our faith in God that he will provide for us remember guys the Great Commission can be fulfilled through spreading the gospel spreading the word which we're all commanded to do and through the womb that is one of the ways that God grows his church now this is just me but there are some situations in which I think it could be appropriate to abstain from marital relations for a time. That's something that could be done faithfully so that you could better fulfill God's command to be fruitful and multiply. Just a couple examples would be abstaining for a period of time postpartum so a woman has a chance to heal and nourish herself a little bit before getting pregnant again. And while I absolutely am not a proponent of extreme child spacing like Weston A. Price style, I'm not a proponent of that. I do think that it could be considered biblically wise to strategically abstain just so the mom can recover, replenish a little bit, and nurse that little baby before getting pregnant and drying up again. Most women don't dry up right when they get pregnant. It's usually between the second and third trimester. So right around six or seven months, a lot of women will completely dry up. Okay, another big question is what about sterilization? Well, nobody calls it this, but this is what it is. Sterilization, so vasectomy or tubal ligation. Um, you guys here on YouTube might not know this, but my husband actually had a vasectomy after our third baby. Now, my husband does not have social media. He doesn't like social media. So while he doesn't mind me talking about these things, like I tell him I talk about these things, I just wanna be careful with how much information I share. So I'm not gonna share what led to him getting a vasectomy or everything that transpired in between him getting it and getting it reversed. But just know that he, he got one after our third child and then he did get it reversed. And that is why we have four children now and hopefully why we will have more children. So they can be reversed. If you guys didn't know that, it can be pretty pricey, but there are a couple of doctors in this country, in the US who will do it relatively inexpensively. The one we went to, I think it was like 3,700 or something. So not too bad at all. And that is here in Missouri. And then there's one in Oklahoma who I think the price is under $2,000. So I'll link those for you guys in the description if anybody here is interested. This is really an easy one to answer. I would just answer it using the same logic I did when talking about using birth control or natural methods of contraception or family planning. We shouldn't take things that are working just the way God created them to work and that he called a blessing and then break them. We shouldn't do that. That's always going to have negative consequences. There are many negative consequences to vasectomy, both short-term and long-term, and these things are not talked about. But a huge percentage of men who get vasectomy will have chronic testicular pain. Most couples who get vasectomy who are married experience regret. That is definitely something that they don't tell you. Most men who get a vasectomy will have prostate cancer, within 30 years, and men who get vasectomy develop antibodies to their own sperm and autoimmune conditions. Once again, these are things that your doctor is not going to tell you, and if you want to know why they're not gonna tell you this and why you won't find this information, then I would recommend this book. It's called, Is Vasectomy Worth the Risk? And it's written by an MD. It talks not only about the risk of vasectomy, but also why this information is suppressed. And spoiler alert, it's because vasectomy is a very profitable procedure. Another comment I get a lot is, well, well, my pastor said that it's totally fine. He said there's nothing in the Bible that says I can't use birth control. He said he and his wife use birth control. That, I have to say, I am not surprised at all. In fact, I would say 
not exaggerating, probably 99% of Protestant pastors these days would say that. They would agree with you that, go ahead, use any kind of birth control you want, wait a couple years after marriage to have kids, plan out your family perfectly, a boy and a girl, and then be done and get a vasectomy. They're probably going to tell you all those things and they're probably going to make it sound really good and pull out a few verses here or there to make their case. So I know that the viewpoint that I am presenting to you today is not popular in the church at all, but it's really important for you to know that has only been the case for the last 90 years or so. Prior to the Conference of Anglican Churches in Lambeth in 1930, contraception was universally condemned in every single Christian church, Catholic and Protestant. In August of 1930, thanks to the efforts of eugenicists like Margaret Sanger, the Anglican Church said that contraception was permissible within marriage and the reason that they gave is because they didn't think that married couples were capable of using self-control. So if you know your fruits of the Spirit, you will recognize that something is very off right there from the beginning. From the very first mention of contraception being biblically permissible by any Christian denomination, their reasoning that they gave is because they don't think that married Christian couples are capable of displaying one of the fruits of the Spirit. But that's what started all of this. And actually it was just a few months later, I believe in March of 1931, when the Council of Protestant Churches in the US followed suit and made the same recommendation. And that paved the way for the Protestant Church to okay the pill. And I don't know if you guys know this, but at one point, many denominations, including the SBC, even okayed abortion. I hope you guys will do some fact checking do your own research on this and understand that the root of this whole concept of limiting family size or family planning using contraceptives, the root is evil. And we can see that by the fruit. The fruit is less children being born. Whether it's accomplished by abortion or contraception or couples just deciding that they don't want children, none of this is biblical. And I truly believe that this is one of the greatest areas of blindness in my age. We can look back throughout church history and see that at certain points in history, there was just a, a spirit of blindness over a huge part of the church. I mean, you guys, look back to slavery. There were many professing Christians who were slave owners. We can look back at a lot of times in history and think to ourselves, how did they reconcile that with scripture? How did they reconcile that with being God-fearing? And I truly believe that future generations are going to look back and they're going to say that about us. How did they reconcile having a spirit of not wanting children to be born I could talk about this forever, but I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up. One thing I did wanna share with you guys before I go is this book right here. It's called Taking Charge of Your Fertility. This is not written from a Christian perspective, but as far as I know, this is just the best resource out there right now on understanding how your cycles work as a woman. And the method in this book is actually the reason that we have a fourth child because after my husband got his reversal, it actually took us almost a year and a half to get pregnant. And that whole time I was thinking that it was because his reversal didn't work but come to find out it was actually me. My cycles were not compatible with maintaining a pregnancy. It was by using the method in this book to chart my cycles and then using an herbal remedy that I was able to normalize my cycle within three months and then get pregnant. So I highly recommend this to you guys. I will also link my Instagram highlights where I talk about this topic in depth, like a lot more in depth than I did today. And I have tons of resources and sermons and quotes from early church fathers all the way through to the reformers. And then I share the different perspectives from the church today. If you guys are still watching, thank you for hanging in there. I know this was a long one. Feel free to share your questions, comments, thoughts, anything you got, just share it in the comment section. If after watching this video, you are mad at me, you don't like me anymore, and you strongly disagree with me and wanna say so, that's fine. It's not gonna hurt my feelings. I know this is a really controversial topic, but it just doesn't bother me to talk about it. I've heard it all. I've gotten all the mean messages over on Instagram. Anytime I talk about this, it just doesn't bother me. Oh, before I go, one thing I did wanna say is I do not have the authority or desire to counsel anyone one-on-one. -on -one. So if you have like a really rare or unique 
situation. If something I shared convicted you or piqued your interest, just take the resources that I have shared and comb over them and then go talk to your husband about that. Get his opinion, his input, and if you guys want further counsel, then maybe seek counsel from your church or a Christian couple or friend that you guys really respect. But do remember that 99% of the modern Protestant church is very pro birth control and only wants to look at this on the surface level. So if you're looking for guidance deeper than that, just keep that in mind. At the end of the day, I am just a random lady on the internet. So once again, don't take my word for it. Everything that I've shared, go check it out, go do some investigation, pray about it, talk to your husband, seek wise counsel. And even if you're at a point in your life where your childbearing season has passed, you never know. Maybe you will learn something or be convicted of something that you can share with your daughters. All right, guys, well, I need to get dinner going, so I'm gonna hop off here. Be sure to hit subscribe and the like button before you go or the dislike button. If you didn't like it, hit dislike. I will see you guys next time, and next time I'll probably have more homesteading content. Okay, little preview. Next time I see you guys, we will be turning this little sunroom into a nursery for little Ernie. All right, I've got his little crib in here. So, still need to do quite a few things, but I think this is gonna be so cute. Uh-oh, mommy's gonna need to raise that, huh? Hello. Boo.